it is a serious work. I'm here to introduce uh, the showcase, the state of Indian animals. The concept of the showcase is an introduction of key animal protection challenges in India. We hope it will set the stage for the in-depth conference sessions to follow. This will be an orientation to different issues as also to introduce new issues concerning the welfare of animals. It will explore ongoing actions and what the way forward is. The panel members are, and please join us on stage, Abhod Aras, Shirani
really because that um, I, I was doing a little research and in India today about 100 cities and towns are doing a sterilization program. In the last 10 years about 1.5 million street dogs have been sterilized. So you can imagine that at least these dogs, I mean earlier they used to be killed and now of course a lot of municipalities are not doing any sterilization programs but at least these dogs are being sterilized. Uh, but um, no also because that, I mean many of you who are in various towns and cities are grappling with trying to uh, convince your municipalities to either start a sterilization program or even stop the displacement of street dogs or even the random killing of dogs that keep happening all the time. So, so that, that, is, that is a big challenge of how we would follow this topic. Two also because that we have not been able to reach, though 100 towns is great, but we have not been able to reach uh, smaller towns, B class, A class cities and so on. So there are huge states that, that may not have, maybe, maybe one or two cities just having a sterilization program. So I think that is something that, that we need to look at how that would change. Um, I think it's important for us just not to understand ABC or uh, what we keep calling the sterilization program by just numbers. A lot of us say that how many have been done, but it's very important to understand that this ABC program is a holistic program. So it's just not about numbers and each one of you, I'm sure, who has, uh, who's doing anything with street dogs should have read two documents. One is naturally the ICANN Human uh, Dog Population Management, Management Guidance uh, uh, Manual. And two is the Animal Welfare Board of India's Manual of SOPs for the Street Dog Sterilization Program. Please remember that it not only goes into the methods of sterilization and so on, but it talks about sensors, it talks about the importance of doing education and awareness, it talks about different techniques naturally are, that are used. And um, it's very important for us that if we have to make the sterilization program a success, we need to go into all these uh, details. Um, the techniques used by everybody are different. You know, I mean, some of some of us use the, the traditional technique of, of keeping the dog for four to seven days by doing a flank or vitrin uh, surgery. Some some now have started doing what is called the CNVR, the catch, neuter, vaccinate, and release. But that only after the animal welfare board has given that permission. And some have been allowed to do laparoscopy, and I'm sure you will hear about these techniques in this conference. Uh, but the most important part is that, irrespective of the technique that, that you're doing, you need to have a very high quality sterilization program. I mean, it's no point we doing sterilization and there being mortality, because then it is no different from what the municipalities used to do, that is kill dogs. It's also very important, and like General Chuck has said before, that we need to fast track the program. So I think we need to open our eyes and minds to new techniques. You laugh, at, and I also laugh, and I remember that when we started in 1994 in Bombay, and we said we do 120 dogs a month, and everybody said, are you mad? 120 dogs, you're going to kill them. So you can imagine, I mean, anything new always, you know, has suspicion. So, so we need to open up, of course, we need to have good people doing it, they need to be thorough doing it, and they need to be very well qualified. Uh, one aspect of the street of uh, issue or the, or the welfare issue is our public health aspect of the street of uh, program. Uh, it's very important for us, and I think each city, each NGO, each individual needs to have some knowledge about the qualitativeness and the quantitativeness of rabies, deaths and, and dog bites in the city. It's very important for us to know because you have wild uh, numbers that are floating around saying so many thousand dog bites and so many thousand deaths and so on. And for us to refute that, we need information. It's also very important because then with limited capacity and limited resources, we can actually prioritize areas that are that seem that there are no dog bites or no babies that's happening. Um, you, you will see that, that this has helped many projects and in cities like um, Kalimpong, Chennai, Bangalore, Gangtok, even Mumbai, where not the number of babies deaths have either been helped. 
solutions for the issues that I have spoken about and many other that you feel I have not. 
again, if you look at India, we consumed meat consumption in 1980 in 2005, our meat consumption increased by 40% and our milk consumption increased by 70%. China has its commitments also. The consuming a lot of milk and meat is something. So why we consume a lot of milk and meat, why we consume uh, all of this, uh, we are dealing with millions and millions of animals within the country as well. And each of these species of animals give you an enormous amount of pain and suffering while they are raised and slaughtered for food. I want to very quickly take through each of these species and figure out what's the problem with them. As I said, I'm not dealing with the solutions, we will be dealing with solutions in another session. In meat, the, the problem starts in Shandy, in transport, as well as in the In China's animal market, this is something that we very currently see. There's no shade, no water crops, animals are tied close to the picture of any animal market anywhere in this country. Animal APMC, agriculture produce marketing corporations, who really manage these children, manage these markets, collect money from vendors who sell their cows here, sell their cattle here, but absolutely provide no infrastructure. You will see that most of them have no loading ramps. There are no unloading ramps in any of these shelters. Overloading is very, very common, even though know, the law requires only a certain number of animals to be loaded from every truck. You will find that almost in all places, animals are overloaded constantly. Animals who are not supposed to be slaughtered, the slaughterhouse rule says that no animal below six months old can be slaughtered. But again, in all markets, in all slaughterhouses, it's very easy to see blue calves who are of no economic value to the milk industry being killed for slaughter or sold for slaughter. And when they get transported from one place to the other, they sometimes transport it by foot and they're transported by foot, they're tethered together. It's a huge amount of cruelty that happens to them. And they're transported by in trucks, the winding roads sometimes, just transporting them from one state to the other because of various different kinds of animal laws or cattle protection laws that we have in different states, uh, these animals are injured during transport. Animals collapse during transport. Here is a picture of animal animals standing on a down car. Uh, and in other words, of course, none of the even the slaughterhouse rules very specifically require that each place has to be a has to have every animal needs to have a lineage, needs to have an unloading area, needs to have a loading area, needs to have a room pre mounting as well as a post mounting because they need there's no proper holding area in most of the slaughterhouses. Most sheep and goat are, are handled like this in any slaughterhouse in the country. And in contravention of the Convention of Animals Act, animals are slaughtered in one quite a full view of each other. There's a huge amount of public hygiene concern because there's no health officer, there's no one who is looking into this meat to figure out whether it is actually fit for human consumption. In this one particular slaughterhouse, the butcher himself was marking each of these meat to be safe for human consumption. Again, animals can be brought you see meat being handed in the same uh, slaughterhouse where animals are something very common in any slaughterhouse or the Huge amount of environmental hazard. The Supreme Court requires that every habitat in the country needs to have a carcass organization center, and most habitats don't have carcass organization center. They mix the inerts, the waste of these animals, into domestic sewage, and they pose a huge amount of environmental hazard. Any person who is being around this carcass can say that it's almost virtually impossible to just pass by without feeling passing. With regard to poultry meat and eggs, at least the transport and slaughter that I would say the animal protection community has been very active. You keep reading news that somebody is confiscating some truck, somebody is filing the case, there's constant inspections in these slaughterhouses that's happening because of the animal will to go to India, as well as the Supreme Court case that is pending. But there's this complete industry which absolutely runs with no inspection, no licensing at all, and that's the poultry meat and egg industry. They're even less than an April's shy sheet of paper by the entire space. As in, this is how most of India's egg meat has spent their entire life. Even less than an April's has spent their paper. Battle pieces have now become very, very popular. Thousands of birds are intensely confined. According to the industry statistics, now an average farm confines 50,000 birds in a, in a facility. Thousands of birds are intensely confined. Better laws because they need to pick and when they, when they feed, their body wraps up into the cages. There's absolutely no opportunity to perch. A bird behaviorist, people who study these birds, says that hence they all of the birds love to perch. They need to be, they need to have a perch to rest on. But there's absolutely no opportunity to perch for these 180 million birds who are observing. Similarly, the broiler birds, when they're slaughtered, they're really chicks, they're 45 days old. They are, they are trade selected, some things have to be modified to put on a weight up to a kilo, two kilos in 45 days. Their whole body structures don't have the ability to take on the weight. Most of them have broken bones, broken wings. They're transported this way, even though this is again an offensive to the traditional people and animals act. Any chicken shop, any chicken market that you go, you see that animals are going to be transported in a complete violation. What about the dairy industry? Of course, India has been very proud of its cooperative model of dairy industry. 
country, one of the largest problems being that there is a huge amount of wolf dog population. But other than that, our housing has been apparently better. We don't have mega industrial farm, but that's changing. Uh, even though in our minds, every single vegetarian who consumes milk thinks that it's okay because of the symbiotic relation that we can relate to Krishna. And this is a, uh, this is a garden from Krishna Mandapai and Mahanakura. You see this relation that Krishna is actually making the cow. The cow wants to pet its cow, is, is grooming its cow. But this is not how the dairy industry functions in Islam. The future of milk production in dairy in India is all industrialized. Where these animals will never be to see their cows. They are artificially inserted. Most of the bull cows will be slaughtered the day that they are born. Most of the female cows will be sent off to growing centers where they will, uh, where they will induce growth producing hormones so that they are in puberty so that they can be used for milk production quickly. Uh, again, automated milking machines are going to become common and this is where the milk industry is heading. If we need to double our milk production by 2050, this is the only solution to do so. So, of course, there are laws and we can speak about them in 2020, but is there something simple that we can do? Many times, and most people hear something feeling that the milk industry obviously comes with, does not come with that kind of milk as the leather of the meat industry. But we need to realize that the milk, meat, and the dairy industry are all interlinked. It's the, it's the used animal of the cow milk industry that becomes the leather, that becomes the meat of some industry. The full cups of uh, milk industry is what turns into suede and the leather industry. They all are interlinked. And what's the simplest way? Tomorrow we'll talk about the law, we'll talk about lobbying. We'll talk about lobbying with uh, agriculture produced operations to build crops. But as a quick takeaway, why we are sitting today, is this something that we can simply do to help these millions of animals? First of all, we need to refine the methods of production. And we can talk, I think if you, if you didn't like what in my session, we talk about various refinement methods that are available and how we can help to implement these. But the second most important thing is reducing the consumption of animals. There's no way we can continue to consume the number of animals that we do. Consume the keep up on the consumption, but yet to produce these animals in a humane manner, it's impossible, it's, it's, it's practically impossible. So one needs to reduce consumption of animals and replace uh, animal products with non-animal alternatives. By doing so, there will be fewer number of animals, a fewer number of animals will lead to a higher level of sustainability, and higher level of sustainability will obviously mean an improved animal products. This is a very quick wrap of our farm animals in India. Please take time to make decisions. We next have Suparna Gangali who will introduce us to the captive wild animal issues in India. Suparna is currently president of Trupa and is a trustee of the Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation Centre. She has served on the Elephant Task Force of the Ministry of Environment and Forest and the Central Zoo Authority. Suparna. Thank you, Amla.
education efforts under the most inappropriate and unacceptable conditions. The informal entertainment trade of Madari's used monkeys, snake charmers, and many elements continue in the districts and towns of India. The religious institutions in India follow under the guise of culture and tradition the practice of keeping elephants in the most horrific captive conditions. The Indian animal welfare movement, with myriad and pressing issues at hand, has not been focused into seeking redressal for captive wildlife in zoos and with other agencies. The time has now come for committed groups specifically formed to work on the plight of wildlife in captivity. To be effective in this field, knowledge is essential when making a case for improvement of a particular facility or to recommend closure. To question the authorities, observations, analysis and report writing skills with species specific knowledge will indicate that matters cannot be ignored and that the voice is not only one of emotion and concern but of knowledge, facts and figures. Today, Indian zoos are at crossroads between balancing welfare for animals in captivity and affording entertainment for the visiting public. There are 198 recognized zoos in India as of March 2011, of which we have 71 important ones. There are 7 large zoos, 16 medium, and 48 small zoos, again as of March 2011. The Central Zoo Authority, CZA, was created in 1991 with the primary objectives of monitoring that zoos follow norms and standards, upgrade technical skills of zoo personnel, regulate acquisition of animals, encourage research and captive breeding of endangered species, helping zoos with scientific and contemporary management and conducting zoo education programs. Unfortunately, zoos are frequently in the news and for all the wrong reasons, which include unnatural animal deaths, inappropriate enclosures, inclusion of common animals and birds which need not be kept captive, lack of trained personnel and naturalists, and lack of monitoring teams. A recent news article states that in the last three and a half years, animal deaths in state-run zoos show 39.13 percentage from southern states. This trend seems to have continued according to this report. However, there is fallacy in the article. Throwing figures around without knowing the number of animals in the zoos, their ages, cause of death and other factor, reveals the lack of serious research in this field. This gives us all the more reason for engagement and long-term consistent study to understand the way forward to protect animals in zoos. This may need collaboration with research groups, universities and with experts in quantitative and qualitative research. There have been proposals to send elephants to third-rate foreign zoos without any due diligence being done on the receiving zoos. Social animals like gorillas, chimpanzees, zebras have been housed in isolation for years in spite of season days, guidelines and directives. Deaths due to tuberculosis, pneumonia and trypanosomiasis have been common. I reiterate the fact that there is lack of pressure groups within the animal welfare community in India that has not looked at some animals with a view to change or improvement. There has also been a stand that at best can be described as visionary and idealistic in a sense that no animals should be kept captive. Hence, sustained efforts to engage with them for improvement of closure has not been seriously focused upon. Today, we need to engage with zoos to ensure benefit for the thousands of confined animals. Our vision for zoos would need to state that zoos can be relevant if their objectives are to conserve endangered animals with a view to release them back in the wild to better the conditions and welfare of the captive animals by ensuring that they are housed with least deviation from the wild conditions, to house animals rescued from various sources or saved from man animal conflicts, and to limit spaces for public facilities and species for display in free space to ensure natural conditions for animals. We need to align the objectives of this use to the original vision of conservation and education that the authorities promote so well and point out that their documents, wherever applicable, to reveal 
has friends are shot from its of the conservation goal. In India, a cause for serious concern is also the fate of about three and a half to four thousand captured elephants. There has been no census ever taken nationally to gauge if there is increase or decrease in these numbers in the various management regimes. Elephants in India are found in zoos, services, temples, private ownerships that use them for begging, hiring for processions, logging, festivals, and tourism. They are also found in government owned forest camps. From 2006 to 2011, Cuba and ALC in Bangalore conducted exhaustive research to arrive at some conclusions. The findings were dismal but interesting. The worst managements, almost at par with each other, were the circus, temples, and private ownerships. Following closely were the zoos. Much better and in scope for greater improvements were the forest camps of the southern and eastern states. The reports were duly presented to the authorities, and it may have, I state cautiously here, been the reason for the ban of the keeping elephants in zoos. Further, Detailed inspections today are being carried out by various committees on service elephants in the country. However, this has also thrown open a huge gap in planning and strategy for them. The authorities have not factored in the need for care centers for these elephants. So, the bans may be partially ineffective in the short term. Long term, these institutions will not be able to acquire fresh elephants for their business. Pet shops in India are on a current high with imported exotic species like capuchin monkeys, marmosets, herbies, pythons, and anything you may desire and you have money for. The animal welfare movement should now work closely with the government of India and the ministries of trade, commerce, import, and export if they wish to present a strong and elective voice to all this trade. To summarize, all NGOs cannot possibly do all things. New teams have to form and work exclusively and intensively on subjects that previously were small and insignificant in school. But with changing global standards, increasing disposable incomes, rampant corruption, and proliferation of agents and traders, animals today are more at risk than ever before. We need to define priorities and engage with the system before it is too late to intervene. A case in point are the proposed recent dolphin areas in some coastal states. White cup dolphins will now provide entertainment for the Indian public. A concept already popular in the West, it's now rearing its ugly head in India. These magnificent mammals will be confined to sea enclosures and will be trained in performing uh, uh, entertainment. This activity is termed as ecotourism and states are lacking it. To all the groups and individuals present here to engage with the cause of captive wildlife and define their goals for the future, goals which are inclusive of protection for wildlife in captivity. Thank you. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Yes, there is a ban in 2009 in Indian schools for any elephants, but with a lack of rescue centers and care centers, they have been they cannot be moved out to forest camps as have been proposed in the order because the zoo elephants are all uh, in highly physically um, dilapidated conditions, I would say, or they are very old, or they have health conditions, and they cannot adapt to the wild immediately. They will need transit care centers for at least some years before they get transferred, and they cannot be used for tourism with many false Yes, please, uh, hello. Supanna, about the uh, dolphins and about the tourism, this isn't in any way uh, all the animal organizations and individuals who have approached the tourism minister of the center. Very closely by, uh, by uh, federation, and I think 
there will be a move forward now for all of us present here to make it into a collective campaign and present the findings with proper research and not, you know, just on uh, what we think. We know it is wrong. We know that it is quite unsuitable and we will not be able to manage this kind of activity. But we need to back it up with proper surveys, research and findings and tell the authorities why we find it inappropriate for Indian relations. You know, as being the wife of the hotel here myself, we could, uh, you know, we have proper document, we could circulate it among ourselves, ourselves as the hotel and uh, travel agents. And then it's their responsibility that their conscience think about it before they do. Because we try to get elephant rights with some of the travel agents, and I, I know a couple of Indian travel agents who say, no elephant rights at all. But they're still whose business is focused, you know, that bread and butter or cheese from that, and it's very difficult. But there are some very conscious people who do it, so we you know, stop it before it gets... You know something, I think it probably lacks definition, the campaign, that it's a very effective way to get people, like hoteliers and people, manage the way to approach authorities, backed up by an entire uh, group to give them support, you know, technical support. Yeah, without, it, without proper documentation, authorities would not want to believe many things. And I think we could go there. And if, if there's anything required for Jeff, we have very detailed analysis. We will, we will put it forward and for documents. Absolutely, tomorrow session, we will be concentrating on that. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, I hope you have now aligned yourself with the issues and during the lunch break please make sure you register for the afternoon sessions outside. I now call upon Roma uh, to sum up the session.
But that is the case of all injustice. Injustice simply gets manifold as you understand its dimensions. What happens is we get trapped in a certain sense in one subject. And we are working within it with it all our might. But there are many cruelties, many animals waiting silently for someone to notice their cruelties. And that is why some of us thought that there needs to be an organization which will keep a tag on things. An organization not actively involved in solving an animal cruelty, not directly involved in helping an animal, but an organization which will keep a tab, which will watch the scenario and try to do something about it in a different way. Hence, the Aposkum, the Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations, with a job in its hand to find out what activities are taken up and how we can further them. If you are working with dogs, what help do you need? How do we push it forward? To find out what areas are left out and what needs to be done. Nobody doing something about something, how do we get it started? To find out whether research is required into certain topics and how to arrive at a a document which somebody will, with the country will take note of. To examine whether a campaign needs to be started. Should we start something our people generally, the Chief Minister talked about smoking this morning. It was right for a kind of campaign. So what kind of campaigns can be taken? Do we on the other hand require a law? Is there a legislation required? Have we reached the end of
experimentation is a big risk. But as far as farm animals go, we can certainly reduce the slot, reduce the, the flight of the animals in a number of ways. And some of the actions being pursued by Fiat are setting up a code, uh, a document for breeding. Translated, it means if there is a dairy farm, where you are milk, milking animals, what is the code that will be followed? Will you milk the animal till it's dry and dead to the bone, or will you have some respect? Can we use the amount of milk, meat, eggs that these animals have to produce? Can we be a little compassionate if we cannot be fully compassionate? Now, this is done by a number of ways. One is we are trying to work on the rules. There is something called the Registration of Cattle and Premises Rules 1978, decades ago, which must be a some old archaic idea. We are trying to see if we can get those rules amended to improve habitation. We are trying to talk to animal husbandry departments and dairy education institutes to see whether they can inculcate in the departments that they work
these certificates of appreciation to all our wonderful speakers for sharing their expertise and their insights today. Again, we are not giving out uh, things that you are going to put on a mantle or a, or a shelf somewhere. We are going to be planting the trees. Thank you so much. Each one of you are a strength and an inspiration to all of us.
imagine with much optimism they have presented you a scenario apparently cell phones will no longer be there but there will be telephones into which you can send a message satellites will transmit the tune you want to hear from your voice chip which is in your ear because in the year 2012 a whole lot of caring people took charge of the earth and decided to change it dramatically and in 2015 people were able to be awakened to a world of peace and pleasure and harmony with the earth for all its inhabitants human beings animals plants birds Let me tell you what it means for the animals. In India alone, apparently, all our tiger care projects will have borne fruit, and there will be 40 tiger reserves, with the numbers up from a low of 700 today to some 15,000 plus. Most people will be vegetarian. Millions will be vegan. Meat eating will be banned in 15 states. Those who eat meat. Nobody will touch them. Zoos will be closed, and in their place there will be sanctuaries for animals, and animal protection organisations will be as common as schools. Now I'm sure you want to rejoice, but now you're wrong. In this idealistic world of 2050, the generous donor who is backing every of your donations. Change. I'm 
exist today and which you don't want to see in the year 2050. But one of the 